Hey everybody, A.L. Levy here, CEO of URM Academy and guitarist for Doth. And with me is Jesse Zaretti, who is the orchestrator and another guitarist in Doth, in addition to being an award-winning composer who's done a bunch of work for games. You all have played uh, stuff for Marvel. I'm sure you've heard of them. I'm sure you've also heard of Netflix. Uh, he does this a lot. Uh, and so it's always awesome to pick his brain about orchestration because and those of us that make metal um or even those of us who don't know that uh orchestration and synth it's just really really hard to get right and uh and jesse gets it right so i said jesse how are you doing i'm good i'm excited to do this this yeah, is a man. Thanks great for being track here. yeah no i'm this is great it's uh a lot of fun to do this type of stuff and i'm glad we're doing this for no rest no end that's right. So speaking of what we're doing, uh, our band Doth just put out a new single on Metal Blade Records. It's called No Rest, No End, and it is a pretty intensely orchestral track at times. And we figured we'd break that down for you. Yeah, so, great. Yeah, great. I think, yeah, let's play him some of the song and uh, let's get into it. Okie doke. Here we go. cool hey yeah may maybe yeah so that's like the intro and there's some cool synth in the chorus and i think the baroque section as well would be cool and we just want to give you all an idea of what's in the song and then we'll get into some specifics i'll lead this one in with a little bit of uh some of the part before it so we can have some context Uh, the next part. I just want to let it keep going. <laughs> it's hard to turn it off. Um, want to check out the broke part too? It's a yeah, really let's check out the broke part. And these these are the three parts that we're going to dive into. Yeah. Let's see. Let's start it over here. I think it would be cool uh, for everyone to hear just what the orchestra alone on that Baroque part sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's an exhausting part, man. Just to listen to it, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's just check out the uh, orchestra by itself. I'll do the orchestra stem and then we'll jump down earlier. Uh, let me get the keys on too. Thank you. 
a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I, I'm curious, and I know that lots of people are going to be curious about this. The number one question is, uh, what libraries are you using to get that? It sounds so good. It sounds like, uh, <clears throat> it, like if you combined the, that cool synth sound from, uh, the clockwork orange soundtrack, like this stuff that Wendy Carlos was doing in the seventies, but with like a real orchestra as well, it's just, a, it's such an interesting sound. I'm just curious, like, what are you using? So I use a lot of libraries to make it as full and uh, real as possible. But um, the cool thing about this track is the combination, the pairing of the synths and the the human elements, I guess you can call it. And, you know, like Wendy Carlos, the stuff that was going on back in those days was so ahead of its time. And it's so cool that even today it still works. Um, we have harpsichord in here. Um, I'm I'm a very 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 big proponent of Spitfire's libraries. Um, I use the Spitfire BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro is kind of my staple that will always be in a session that I'm working on. Um, <clears throat> but I also use a couple other libraries to create some more uh, depth to it as well. But for the most part, like the lead instruments that you'll hear in the mix are going to end up being Symphony Orchestra Pro, which is the reason why I like this library is because you can get ensembles, but you can also get the leader. So for example, in uh, a symphony ensemble, there's going to be one person who's kind of the top of the food chain, I guess you could say, and they the handle master. the concert master. Yep. So they they they're kind of like the solo guitar player of the the symphony uh they'll stand up and play by themselves or they'll lead apart and uh this library allows you to have the leader of every ensemble section so you'll have cello um you'll have string bass all the all the lead players for each section the the top of the the food chain will be in their own section which is great because uh those actually add quite a bit of to the uh overall storytelling of what you're doing with with the music so let, let me understand something so it will it be like uh coming out of the plugin as a blend of like you've got the string section and then also within the sound coming out of that one instance is also the uh the leader of the section or is it two instances like one of them set to the leader one of them set to the section uh, blend like how does that yeah work in this instance, I'm just using the ensembles, um, which is, you know, it's it sounds great. The, another reason I forgot to mention for BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro is the control that I have over the mics, um, because when we send these stems off to uh, Jens, for example, uh, you don't want a ton of reverb because hall reverb, um, it's mic'd in such a different way compared to like a band, for example. So like when you're doing drums, it's it's just different. And uh, having control over those mics is really important. And this library gives me that ability to send Yen something that he can add his own reverbs to that match more of what's going on in the Doth stuff. So that's another reason why I use this. But yeah, I, I, I create as many instances as possible. Um, and that's just so I have uh, different articulations, sounds more real, and I have some more control over who's doing what. Because uh, there's this isn't just... Uh, we're not just taking guitar MIDI and throwing that in here. This is a uh, non-rhetorical voice leading that we're doing. So uh, I got to I got to be able to shift between a, a leader and then also the ensemble. OK, so you're using several instances per section. Uh, do you mind maybe soloing some of the sections and some of the individual layers so we can hear some of like what goes into that? Because sure. we've heard it all together. But uh, since you're using some of the instances, that's actually tweaks my curiosity. Yeah, let's start in the beginning. Let's do the string section by itself first. Okay, so what's going on there? So we do have the BBC uh, libraries up here, but we also have um, Abbey Road. Uh, we have some other libraries here too. Audio Ollie, uh, which is not on this computer, but it's not a focus sound. Um, we have 
quite a lot of the ensemble split up. Um, and very particularly, we have uh, first violins, which is going to be the first row, and then violins second is going to be the row behind them. Um, and we have the MIDI is all in accordance to their register. You're hearing all the, you might be hearing some different techniques and you might be hearing some different dynamics going on. And that's all done in the MIDI automating, which I can jump into if you'd like. Now, uh, let's, I, let's get into that in a minute. I want to get, sure. I want to talk a little more about what just these layers are of instruments. So you got them all sectioned out on their own track. Um, and what did you mean by non-focus? You said you don't have that on a certain library on this computer, even though it's in there, but it's not a focus. What do you mean by yeah. that? <clears throat> um, so I have some layers here from other libraries, and I'm mostly using the reverbs from it just to kind of create some, to fill the gaps, basically, between the notes. Um, so they're not really... Soloed, maybe? Just to, so that, see if I like, what a non-focus sounds like? Yeah, you're going to you're still going to hear the strings, but you're not going to necessarily hear um, like w when it's mixed. Jens has a different version of the mix for that. So let's see. So I'm mostly using that for the like the way that it's blended in the stem mix for 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 the final mix was to be used uh, as kind of like reverb that creates some fills the gaps basically because you because sometimes when it's not um when it's not focused in in the right way is when you can really tell that something's not real and uh you can help that by using other libraries just for the way that the articulate these are human beings that are recorded which is why this is such a different approach to writing music is uh you got to remember that these are humans that were recorded at some point they're all in a room together and they don't all play the same way everybody plays differently so it really fills in gaps with articulations yeah like when you're going to watch a symphony playing uh you know a great symphony with a great conductor sounds like one cohesive unit but still those 96 players on stage uh they're not it's not programmed like they are all making um not all but there there's individual discrepancies i'd say between uh between everybody the, let's look at the baroque part i'm curious about the harpsichord and how you layered the harpsichord and the synth and uh what libraries you used for that go here and of course we're going to want to know what you use for brass and choirs yeah absolutely all right let's open this up we also have some piano layer in there, layered in there as well. Um, and then the synths are in here. So uh, I'll give this a play. And what's that doubled with? Like there's because in so there's more than just harpsichord. It's like doubled with the synth or something yeah so we do i do have a synth layer of that as well that, that goes with it because we kind of wanted it to be a little bit of that wendy carlos vibe with that as well um so i almost kind of recreated the sound of harpist chord with the synthesizers which is something that wendy carlos would do uh using oberheim synthesizers so um we can hear that all together here It adds like a richness to it that's really cool and it, and it helps it kind of compete in the the soundscape of the rest of the the band you know it pushes it forward a little bit it's it, it's such a cool sound um because when you think of like a synth orchestra you think i don't know you think of casio but like there's something about the way this this type of sound works that it just sounds cool like it just sounds cool and it has a unique a unique flavor to it and you're right it pushes it to uh to where it can compete with the other instruments and when you have so many layers of guitar such busy drums distorted bass that's like a, it's a serious mixing and arrangement challenge to get this to work um what about uh brass and choirs because <clears> uh, 
Yeah. Uh, I'll just show real quick the... Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. This is, this is the... I love this library. It's very odd. It's really aimed at the classical musician. So it's a conservatoire collection. It's uh, by Sonic Couture. Really cool company. They do... They have instruments in here like the Theorbo. Um, they have four different types of harpsichords, I believe. But I used the Flemish harpsichord on this because it's a little bit more uh, percussive. You know, harpsichords are a really difficult instrument to play it's very unlike the piano it's you have to be a very particular very percussive type of player to make it sound good and uh it's just such it's a really cool instrument um let me add uh, something real yeah. quick sorry to cut you off but this part sure. uh why i think it's so cool that you like were so selective about the harpsichord sound was i wrote this part for a harpsichord originally the original version uh, is on on, well, on guitar, but intended for a harpsichord. And if you hear the original versions, it's like a, you know, my own cheesy harpsichord sound. But uh, that's like, that's what this was for. And so I actually really appreciated you actually making it sound cool and uh, doing your thing. Yeah, and and from a guitar playing standpoint too, uh, what you're doing if somebody watches like your riff hard, for example, and they watch you play this part. The reason why that song, it's going to be so challenging for somebody to learn is because of the lack of repetition. Um, and that is very Baroque. That's a very Baroque thing. It's a very Bach thing to do in, in particular. And uh, as guitar players, we're so used to uh, playing things that we can kind of uh, mnemonically remember, these like groups of things. And this is a type of music where you need sheet music usually to remember how to play it. I know when I was like going over it, I'm looking at it, I'm like, I'd, I have to watch, I'd have to sight read this because it's, there's so much movement and uh harpsichord players were like elite players they were a very different breed so um and flemish harpsichord is one that was used in germany quite a bit too it's it's a really cool sound um and this library does a great thing um so yeah and it paired really well with synthesizer uh the, the synth sound as well um what is and, the synth? oh yeah you already said that yeah, it's it's an Oberheim. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, I believe, some roll. I have a, like a blend of it. I kind of made it. I made this synth patch many years ago. Um, it works really well for synth wave stuff, which I've done in the past too. So it's it's a very diverse synth. Uh, it could play as a bass. It could do a lot of really cool things. Um, but yeah, this this part's great. Uh, when you when you showed me this, I was like, wow, that's going to sound amazing on harpsichord, and I instantly bought this library. Um, <clears throat> what else we so maybe a good question might be also too is like why is there piano just for a short section of this right it's like how come it's why just is right there, there piano for such a short section of this right yeah it's 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 a interesting it was a weird choice that we made and i think that's because it really starts getting busy around the 179 measure here and the piano honestly probably would have stuck out like a sore thumb at that point because piano has such a bright tonality to it that it competes too much with the harpsichord whereas individually if it stops and you let the harpsichord go it really allows the guitar to shine through instead of it being this competition between three different layers um let me let me play this real quick just so i can yeah i want to hear that. sure we i didn't want the guitar to disappear it was such a cool guitar part so if i took this out it's just kind of missing that that layer that kind of gives it a little bit of push um but we don't want that to go on the whole time yeah percussive yep and some t it had some more length to it too which i think helped out a lot with uh, the way it came together in the mix um but yeah it, it, let's take a look at the sense real quick let me get down here also, anybody who's watching this and wants to start composing, try and be as organized as possible. <laughs> Otherwise, your your eyes will spin all over the place when you're doing this stuff. Um, you're gonna hate your life. Yeah, especially when you start getting up. You know, we've we've scaled this back a bit for the final mix, but you can get up into the 300, 400 track count. You don't want to get lost in it. Um, <clears throat> so let's hear these overhands real quick. That's the mid layer, and then I have two low layers. Such a cool sound by itself. Um, yes, we used Omnisphere for this. Omnisphere is amazing. 
especially if you use it, if you treat it like um, your own synth, you're not using it for the built-in stuff. You want to kind of create your own sounds in there and, and sculpt everything, sculpt everything from scratch. Um, I took this layer originally. Um, it's so sculpted that it doesn't, it, if you were to find this in the, the plugin, it's not going to sound anything like it anymore, but it's a, a profit, which is one of the coolest sounding synthesizers on the planet. Still to this day, it's amazing that 50 years later, here we are and these synthesizers are still relevant and sound amazing. Um, and then you have the Oberheim uh, OB-8. Um, and then I turn all this stuff off usually. I leave the compressor on in here because it doesn't matter. But uh, that's that's the sound. It's And I use this all the time. It's very likely that if I've done anything that has any type of electronic or synthesizing in it, it has that synthesizer sound. Uh, I feel like Omnisphere is one of those plugins that if you're going to do synth, and you don't have Omnisphere, what are you doing? Right. I mean, it, their, their updates are incredible. Um, they, it's never, it doesn't get stale. And there's too much in there to, for it to get stale. And it's all in one. You could do sound design in it. You can do industrial heavy stuff. You can do, you can do any type of genre, basically. They have a way to organize by genre. So, if, oh, I'm trying to do trap music. All right, well, you can do, you just click that, and then it'll pull your sounds up. It's very intelligent. Eric Myers is a genius. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's that section. Um, there are some other things going on here if you want me to kind of pick those yeah. out real quick so we can hear it. Well, what's cool about this section, it kind of like encapsulates most of what's in the song arrangement wise because there's also uh, a choir in it. Um, and I believe there's, uh, there's also brass in it. So oh, yeah. Let's yep. take a look at that. And then I think, I think we can take a look after that at the percussion earlier in the song. And sure. then we'll dive into some specifics on how to make this stuff sound cool. Cool, yeah, I'll show you the synths real quick, how it kind of all came together. So much going on, but Do man, does it sound cool. that with the guitar line, just that part, sure. just the lead guitar, just so people can hear like how that works together. Yeah, let's do it like this. Two I keys. play yours, not that one, but just because the the mix version is uh, sure is kind of trimmed. But I you want it with rhythms or the leads? Leads, okay, sure. Leads plus your plus the synth and stuff yeah. would be awesome. It's it's so cool how it comes together too, and even with the rhythm, because um, rhythm is is not just sitting around either. It's moving quite a bit too. It even sounds cooler. It all just comes together. Yeah. All right. Show some choirs. Cool. Let me get this up here. Good. Good choirs, man. It's a it's a thing because uh, in metal we're so used to cheesy choirs. <laughs> Again, we forget that these are human being samples. It's real people playing, so we gotta remember that. Cool. So let me get through here. So what you'll notice too, you can kind of see these peaks and valleys back here. We'll go over that later, but people have to breathe you know and a lot of the times you hear choir and something it's like where what how big are their lungs <laughs> you know like you got to give them their those moments to grab their breath back and you become kind of an elite breather when you're uh, in a choir you have to learn how to breathe in such a technical way it's it's very impressive so um it comes in earlier too do you want, you want to take yeah, a listen yeah, to that let's hear it earlier sure where do we have it? we have like, some sustains here that are cool yeah Yeah, that's cool. All right, so what's going on there? What are you using? For this, I'm using 8DO's Lacrimosa. Let me pull that up. Um, I do often use Spitfire's uh, Eric Whitaker, who's 
if people don't know who Eric Whitaker is, I will explain who he is. He's the Hans Zimmer of the choir world. He's incredible. Very likely, if there's a Hans Zimmer score out there, Eric Whitaker did the choir. He's the kind of guy w when he walks in a room with choir there, everybody's like, oh my God, look, there's Eric Whitaker. He's that guy. I didn't use it on our stuff because it's too pretty. And I wanted it to be pretty, but I wanted it to be dark. And his stuff is just, it's so emotional that it's almost kind of sad and we're going for something different we're going for gothic baroque you know renaissance vibes so that's why i use 8 do lacrimosa and uh the, the the vowels we picked were the ah vowels which you know if people don't know when you're doing choir the shape of your mouth pronounces a vowel and it's almost kind of the instrument articulation um for that specific instrument your voice so um yeah we use this and uh Obviously, there's some automation in there, too, for the dynamics, again, to create the breath of a human being, how, how they would handle it in singing, since we can't just immediately project super hard and sustain for a long time. You got to have that breath rise into it. So, yeah, let's, let's hear what that sounds like, uh, maybe with like the in the context, maybe with like the rhythm guitar, the drums. Sure. And maybe the lead guitar or something. Or maybe just the, I don't know. I got bass in there too. Uh, yeah, let's do rhythm guitar. Let's see how that sounds. Is that cool? Yeah. But I go from earlier where it comes in. Sure. Just because bring it's it cool. here. Yeah, we, we didn't want it to be throughout the entire thing. It would have become, it would have missed the point. Yeah, I appreciate that, by the way, um, that it's not just blanketing it. And I feel like when you hear in a metal uh, orchestral arrangement, you hear a choir and it typically, you, it just, it's almost like a synth pad that just goes continuously. And that's not how a choir works. So I appreciate that this comes in for specific moments to get a specific musical point across yeah and that's because i mean think about all the other layers that we have going on too i mean there's why have a choir going on the whole time if you have violins going on and cello and all that stuff you, you can't do it you can't overdo it you got to think very selfless about these instruments and the way that they come in and work together so yeah do you want to hear it against the strings it might be kind of cool to hear yeah, the context and the that. percussion and stuff oh yeah sure let's get the percussion in And I should, I, I want to ask you something. If uh, it's missing the brass, right? Like there's still yep. brass and stuff that goes there, I think. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what I'm wondering is if there was no metal band, uh, because you got to take that into consideration. If this was not going over a metal band, would the arrangement be? different absolutely we, we would have to make up for some of the intensity i think uh that would be missing within the the drumming in particular because the the drums is where we gave the most room because you know crim is he's not only playing thunderous fills that are really doing a lot of the duty of the the classical style percussion that could be there but he's also playing a lot of notes in some of these sections. So uh, we'd have to find some ways to to fill in the role of Krim in, in, in specific, I, I believe. And then also the lead guitar and a lot of the stuff that's going on. So, yeah. I, I, the reason I'm pointing that out is because if people hear this and they're like, uh, doesn't sound huge by itself or something like that, it's like, well, it, actually, it sounds incredible because it's in an arrangement where there's, it's 
it's working with something that it should not be able to work with. And in order to get it to work with a metal arrangement, you have to make lots of choices as to what to eliminate, where to cut. And it's the same as mixing. You have to cut frequencies in order to get everything in there. And uh, an arrangement, um, you have to look at the bigger picture in order to make it work. Yeah. <clears throat> and we made some really calculated decisions with this. If you remember, uh, I wrote more than what's here. Yes. And that's because we need to be able to place things very specifically. So there's more options and not enough. And then we spent so much time going back and forth, like what sections work, which ones shouldn't be there. Where does it need to just be focused on the riff? Give Sean his time to really push the the song into the, you know, the stratosphere it needs to go. And uh, you got to make really intelligent decisions. It can't just be all the time. You got to make it make sense. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want me to do you want me to just play the orchestra again by itself? Just so people yeah. kind of hear it stand alone. Yeah. So if I put the drums back in, it fills in a lot of the blanks. Those drums sound so good to me. <laughs> what a badass. Um, um, yeah, let's talk. There's also some really cool percussion going on there. Yeah. So pull this out. Um, so anybody listening, there's two different types of percussion in a symphony. There's tuned and then there's untuned. Um, the tuned percussion is going to be something that represents a note. And the reason why it's called tuned is because it might clash with something you're doing if you don't play the correct note. So like tubular bells, for example, is like this giant rack of all these tubes that are next to each other and they're different widths um different gauges etc and they represent different uh kind of pitches and if you don't use the right one it will clash unlike a dr like a kick drum or a snare for example i mean we all know that yes you got to make sure your snare and toms and kick drum get really close but we're not really necessarily hearing a note when we're listening to, you know, a drummer play drums. Um, it's more of like a, a frequency or like a, a register. And uh, for this stuff, there's definitely quite a difference, especially timpanis as well. Um, so this is the the tuned percussion and the cinematic percussion kind of comes together here. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning and then I'll okay. get over to that uh, tuned stuff. So we're creating, we're taking aggression and action and also doing a little bit of tension building with the cymbals, which is the reason why it's not just cymbals all the time. Whereas on a drum kit, you know, we're, it's like a cymbals always playing. Um, this is a little bit pickier. And then this will also have the tuned percussion and the cinematic percussion, the untuned percussion at the same time. I, I think for the tuned percussion part, maybe let's hear it with the drums and the rhythm guitar. Sure. Because it, it, uh, because it works like the way that it works, it almost sounds like a machine. Yep. That was kind of the goal. Like we, you and I have love industrial sounds in metal. So it was cool to do that. All right. So we'll do uh, drums, rhythm guitars, and the tuned only. And then I'll bring in the cinematic just for context, too. I, I, the, the thing that's cool about this arrangement wise is, again, in so many metal uh, arrangements and mixes, 
all this extra percussion that people sometimes add does not lift the song or help the momentum. Uh, we did a lot of talking and a lot of experimenting to make sure that if there was going to be this stuff in there, that it actually made the part move along better and help the momentum of the part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And again, to just like a reminder about the library, um, BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro also has tuned and untuned uh, percussion as well. So um, sometimes I'll use a Celeste from a different library, but um, so much is covered in this one library that it's kind of it's kind of a shoe. And what's cool about this library, by the way, for anybody who wants something like this, they have different uh, tiers of the library. So you can do like the free one. So if, if you don't want to drop money right away, you want to try a free one, they'll give you some kind of group stuff. You have less control, less instruments. And then you have the core version, which will be less articulations. You won't have the leaders and less instruments. And then the pro one is is huge. Um, it's a giant library. It replaces basically a cinematic symphony, which is generally speaking, a symphony is around 100 instruments. That's a lot of people in one room. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And what's crazy, like we don't think about this, but like every person in that room is like top of their class. There's no person in it's like it's like professional sports. Every person there is insane, even if they're like not doing a lot like the triangle player. That guy can still probably throw down with drums. You know, there there's everybody in that room is an elite musician, which is really crazy. Um, but yeah, so the you can organize BBC by uh, sections, which is really cool. So if I head over to percussion, there's untuned timpani harp marimba celeste all this stuff is so cool um you just really need to know how to use it that's the one thing i'll say is like you gotta know how to tune this stuff because if you don't it's impossible to make it sound good um so we're seeing the things that are available here this is all the tuned percussion so i can get those all individually and that's because you need to be able to control tuned sounds so uh, like lock and spiel and celeste will you'll you might want to play it like more muted where the mute is resting underneath the keys a little bit more and uh the untuned percussion you don't really worry about that we're talking about snare drums and all sorts of you know weird things tambourines toys i've never listened to the toys <laughs> before so what about uh what about the brass yeah let's go to the brass brass is my favorite part yeah. of an orchestra by the way and it's yep. very easy to make it sound like crap. It is, isn't Don't it? Forget. It's so easy to make it sound bad, especially trumpets. Um, and I use a lot of different libraries to make this sound real because uh, certain libraries actually do a better job at certain articulations. So, for example, um, music sampling. Uh, Brucky specifically loves that. He's my assistant on this. Um, he loves this library because he can do really in-depth uh, kind of articulations that you can't do with other ones. Um, and I agree. So you're I doing think. you're doing library stacking. Yeah, across the board. Yeah, there's going to be like like the string section too. You know, there's going to be Abbey Row. There's going to be BBC. Um, and we're we're doing the same thing here certain libraries it's just hard to really get them to all to sound amazing uh symphony orchestra pro is the closest one but trumpets is like trumpets is really hard to make sound good if you know a trumpet player they will cringe every time they hear a trumpet library for the most part i've been able to fool a couple of them so far but it's still it's really tough well yeah let's listen to this brass by itself no oh, hold on probably turn off all the other cool stuff there That, that part you just played, do you mind putting the percussion back in so sure. that people can hear, uh, first put the percussion back in and then let's hear it with also drums and rhythm guitar so they can get the full picture of just how cool that part is. Yeah, and then it's, at some point we should do woodwinds too because yeah. they're, they fill in a lot of gaps here. But yeah, let's uh, let's hear this real quick.
So that's with the percussion. You can hear a little bit of John Williams influence in there. <laughs> um, so we want drums and drums. rhythm guitars. Yeah. Got it. And we can do after that a pass with the solo guitars and then we'll talk about winds and then uh, move on. Yeah, not a lot of rhetorical information there with with the composing like not a lot of what's done on guitar is super obvious and what's done with these other instruments that's because it would just disappear frankly it would there's no real point to that you gotta and what's really cool here is there's still the guitar do you, the do you mind adding the lead guitar this sure. is still leaving a lot of space for really the most important thing which is the melody so the everything the drums the rhythm guitar um the percussion the brass like it's all like you hear a lot of space um and that's because there is still a melody that goes over it which is uh this version yep and here, here's something that's probably super obvious the lead guitar that I added, what do you know? The strings are doing the same thing, kind of. Crazy. Stringed instrument, string guitar. You got, like, some of this stuff is so obvious up front, but we don't think about it that way sometimes. So, um, yeah. Anyway. All right, Woodwinds is really cool to add here. Quick. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the brass out for just a second, but it plays really well against the brass in particular. It's really cool. So I'll make sure to come back to that. Let me get the drums off too. Not a lot of woodwinds in here because that's, it's such a uh, mellow instrument uh, or it can be unless you're doing like contra bassoon and you're distorting it, but it can be a pretty mellow sound. So it doesn't really compete very well with uh, distorted guitars. But so here we have flutes and clarinet. metal super cool it's the least metal instrument in in all of this <laughs> but it works it adds some cool layers uh you want to hear that against the brass real quick and then i yeah, can throw yeah. it against the same stuff okay It's like it outlines. Yeah, it does. It does a lot of outlining. And as you can hear, even just against the brass, the brass really cuts through it. Brass is almost like the uh, symphonic distortion in a lot of ways. And uh, as Jens pointed out when he was uh, going over the mix, uh, we often tend to distort a lot of brass using, you know, decapitator or omicide, stuff like that, because it really accentuates that fluttery really raspy nature of of the brass instrument and uh it can it can bury things very quickly so you can kind of hear it's imagine that competing against really heavy guitar tones um this section is kind of cool too because you can really hear the intermittent so I'll, I'll put this on real quick It makes a difference. Yeah. It makes absolutely. a big difference. So, okay. So we've talked about all the individual elements. Um, and so I'm gathering that in order to make it sound as real as possible, uh, you're stacking a lot of libraries um, and kind of like using certain libraries to f add what another library doesn't have. So what I'm wondering is there, are there any, things that you can explain quickly that <clears throat> at, that help the realism in addition to that, that someone that like, if you're saying, if someone was like, what can I do to 
all right, I bought a bunch of libraries. I'm stacking them. Is there anything I should learn how to do that w to make it even more real? Yeah, it's kind of in order. I would put stacking libraries at the end. Like you want to do that at the far end of everything. In the beginning, you want to make sure that every track layer that you add gets humanized as quickly as possible and you do it in the best way that you can. And there's several ways to doing that. Um, just in bullet point, we have expression maps and then we have uh, CC automation. So controlling uh, different functionality of the vibrato, the dynamics, the release of the instruments, uh, depending on which instrument you're using. And then also the way that you uh, write out the notes itself, how, how they're used. Um, so we'll, we'll start with strings because I think this one will cover everything, basically. That really helps with making things sound real uh, before we get to stacking, because stacking is just obvious. It's just add, add more libraries doing the same thing. Um, so down here on the bottom, uh, this all these articulations that are mapped out. Normally, uh, people might be familiar with doing key switches where you go down into like the C negative one, C, ne C negative two territory, and then you just plug in notes and they don't actually play a sound, but they trigger different uh, switching functionality of like articulations like some people are used to doing on bass guitar VSTs where it can go from like slap bass to whatever. Um, it's the only problem that I have with doing that, and it's just a force of habit, is if that information is put into the MIDI, then when I go to put this into score format for, say, like a live orchestra, that's going to be there. And that's not a note that's going to be played by a violin. C negative one is out of out of reach for almost every instrument except for a contra, um, like contra bassoon. So I just my preference is to do things in a much more clean and organized way. Expression maps do have to be specifically created for the VST library you're using. So and and the instrument. So if I have BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro, I have to have cello, violin, viola, all that stuff has to have its own expression map for BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro. So it's a little tedious. A lot of them are available online. You can either buy them or find somebody who's given them away. Um, Brucky made all these. So very lucky that he did that. It's just it, it's kind of like a quality control thing. And it, basically what it allows me to do is much like plugging in MIDI point and clicking, I can just point and click what articulation I want. So, you know, when when a string player is playing, they don't just play one technique all the way through within one piece of music, you're going to hear switches up to hundreds of times. Sometimes you never know. I mean, it, it really depends on what the piece is, but for ours in particular, it could change up to 50 times. And uh, this just gives us the ability to make it as human as possible. If you could imagine it's like a guitar player, it'd be like somebody just palm muting and never doing a hammer on. That would be kind of like leaving out the expression side of things. So this gives me the ability to point and click that and make it really easy. And it also won't communicate to my score editor. Um, and let's see, I'll zoom out on this. So you'll see, we'll go from legato to spiccato to... Uh, I think we have some trills and some tremolo going on in certain spots. Um, so it changes quite a bit. Uh, depends on what the song is. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. What's that modulation uh, CC up here? Yeah. Stuff. Yep. So this uh, this area, which you know, you can just you can change this to whatever you want. But for in this particular instance, I'm using modulation as a means of controlling dynamics. Which when a string player is playing and they're playing with a bow they're not necessarily creating a specific dynamic um, or we'll call it a velocity for them. They're not, they're not just doing one. There's kind of a, a, a ramp up and a ramp down. That's a, a very human thing to do because we just don't have the ability to mechanically do things at one rate all the time. It's not possible. So when, what I do is I write out all of my music first, which you can see up in the, in this area, you can see all the typical MIDI. And then once that's all written out and I have the notes that I want and I do my voice leading and I get everything in a place that I want, I'll go back with a CC controller and use that in a way that kind of simulates the bow, but I have to think a little bit more intelligently while I'm doing that because um, I'm not using a bow. You know, I, I, if I did, I'd be thinking in a completely different way because I'm more focused on the mechanics of it. So in this element, I'm thinking a little bit more strategically and, uh, you can see these like peaks and valleys, and those represent the the bowing technique essentially in conjunction with some really calculated decisions to make sure that I'm allowing certain note groupings like these smaller 
note groupings to have their velocity that would be appropriate. So you'll see more of a ramp up there and no ramp down in, in the middle of it. So technically um, speaking, uh, are you drawing that in with a mouse or are you using an external um, an external unit to like play the automation? Like, yeah. how are you getting that CC, the modulation CC data in there? There's two ways that you can do it. In my instance, it's using a CC controller. So some keyboards will have these little faders on it, kind of like a, a mixer fader. Um, there are boxes that are just specifically designed for people who want to have more control. Um, actually, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about too, because it's I think it's important to see what we're controlling. So when you click in BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro, this weird wheel over here is going to be changes in something right until we define what it is when you click it, it tells you the different things that are available for this technique style uh release is not a part of legato because legato is the opposite of that it's legato is the movement between notes you're you're bridging a gap with sound whereas release might be more important for something like staccato or spiccato which is a shorter note value it's more of a think of it as like a palm mute you don't really want a lot of bleed in between those notes so it doesn't apply to legato. Um, so in this instance, we're controlling uh, the release tightness and vibrato of certain instruments, but it's it's controlling the dynamics, which is the the volume of the instrument and how it, how it ends up sounding. Um, and vibrato is also another element that's controlled in here, which I wouldn't necessarily say affects the human nature of things to like the general ear. But if it was a solo instrument, vibrato is not something that you have on full force all the time. You have to automate that as well. And that's usually kind of an, an exclamation point to, to a passage. So it gets used very sparingly. Um, and to point out something that, again, maybe is obvious, maybe isn't. Legato, you'll see represented by two notes with this thing underneath it called a slur. So when I'm in my MIDI over here, which I'm going to try and keep both up at the same time so you can see it at the same time. You'll notice that the notes overlap one another here. And that's because Legato basically is doing the same thing. There's overlap. It's bringing note into another note with very little space in between. And uh, it has a different sound if you separate it. So if we were... So how you actually enter the notes yeah. um, into the piano roll makes a difference in to what you're going to get out of the plugin. Absolutely, yeah. And, and Legato and... Uh, long notes um and this consordino just means a little bit quieter um they are two different sounds despite doing the same thing playing an extended note value the thing is, is that legato is one that has more of a that's like your hammer on for guitar so it has more of a rolling sound that rolls into one another whereas like a long note will have um it will almost kind of stop it repeats the note with like a, a very dynamic shift so i i specifically pick legato for the reason of overlapping here um Want me to play those? Yeah, like, yeah. Let's I, I can, hear what, the, what the, sure. the, that legato, what what it sounds like, or what sure. or what it doesn't sound like. Okay, so for example, if I took this passage and I shortened it quite a bit, you're going to hear a totally different technique played. Right, it's. It's staggering. If you hear that in a mix, it's going to be kind of like, oh, that doesn't, it won't fit what the guitar is doing, which mm -hmm. we're not letting go of the strings. That's essentially what I'd be replicating here is letting go of the strings. So if I put it back, it, there's more flow to it. And uh, it just, it goes with the guitars. That's what the guitars are doing. Um, and also too, I can point out that what would happen if I put this on long, you can really hear a difference with this. So I'll shorten this. And then I'll put it back. Do you hear how it kind of it ducks down a little bit? The dynamics duck out. Legato removes that duck out. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, I think it's a good place for us to wrap this up. But like what I'm gathering from all this, uh, and I think that people watching who are interested in learning how to orchestrate uh, you're, th we are just scratching the surface here. And uh, actually on URM, we will be doing more 
in-depth stuff about orchestration and also blending orchestra with metal and uh, also doing it in a cinematic context. But I think that those of you who want to do it should really like pay attention to how many different things Jesse was just like rattling off, uh, like that are just part of what part of his knowledge of working with these tools. Like it's not something that you just casually do. You don't just get, I mean, you could just get some orchestral plugins and programs some MIDI, but if you want to get really, really good results, actually knowing what every element of the orchestra actually does, how, how it actually works in real life, what the best registers are for it, which techniques work best with what, and then actually knowing the, uh, the software tools and how they work. That's, uh, makes a massive difference. Agreed. Jesse, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's always enlightening to hear you speak about what you do. Thank you to everybody watching it. If you got this far, you are, uh, you're on your way and, uh, go check out no rest, no end by our band doth. Good luck. Yeah.